Thank you for downloading this podcast from the Forum for Philosophy. Subscribe for weekly discussions of science, culture, politics and the arts from a philosophical perspective. The Forum is a non-profit organisation and our events are free and open to all. You can support our work via our website and Facebook page. Hello and welcome. Thank you very much for being here uh, on what is, you know, not the most beautiful evening weather-wise in London. Um, Thanks for coming out to this event by the Forum on the anatomy of a language, maybe also on grammar. Um, So I'm sorry to people who've heard this spiel before, but the Forum for Philosophy is a charity that believes that philosophical discussions should be accessible to more people than live just within universities. So with that in mind, we try and bring interesting, friendly speakers to talk uh, in public for free about topics of philosophical uh, interest. Okay, so if you would ever like to sponsor us, there's links to the website here. There's lots more podcasts there and essays by interesting people too. Um, But, you know, if you're in a giving mood, feel free to give in that direction. Okay, so I'm just going to introduce our speakers and then we can get down to some some grammar chat. Uh, So to my left here is Richard Hudson, who is Emeritus Professor of Linguistics at University College London. Um, Guy Longworth is Reader in Philosophy at University of Warwick, and Hazel Pearson is Senior Lecturer in Linguistics, Queen Mary University of London. Um, So just maybe to get us moving, Hazel, grammar is a very familiar term to most of us. Um, Scientifically speaking, what do linguists tend to mean when they talk about grammar, or what are some valuable distinctions we might think about in the beginning? Yeah, so when... I think when people sort of hear the word grammar, when, when we first think about what, what grammar is or, or where you might have encountered the word grammar, it tends to be um, in the context of prescriptive grammar. So things like sort of prescriptive rules like um, don't um, split an infinitive. So the example that people always give is the, the Star Trek thing to boldly go where no, one, where no man has gone before. So splitting the infinitive is for some reason... Uh, who knows why, but for some reason is taken to be sort of a bad thing to do. Um, Ending a sentence with a preposition is taken to be something that we shouldn't be doing. And these are sort of rules of prescriptive grammar. Um, And that's not the subject matter of linguistics. So it's not the thing that in my work, for instance, I'm particularly interested in. So linguists draw a distinction between descriptive and prescriptive grammar. So, so what we really are interested in doing is simply describing whichever language it is that we happen to be studying. So if I'm looking at German, then one of the things that I might sort of notice and record in my description is that in subordinate clauses in German, the verb goes at the end a difference between German and English if, you, if you've studied German at all. Um, so, so that, I guess, should be kind of the, the starting point, that, um, that that's the distinction that, that we draw. And, and then we're interested in um, des- des- descriptive grammar in the sense of describing whatever language it is that we're looking at. But ultimately, we're, we're thinking of a grammar as um, a component of the human mind. So we have intuitions about what are um, sentences of English and what are not sentences of English. We have intuitions about the meanings of sentences and so on. Um, we can understand sentences that we've never heard before. And so there must be some property of our mind um, that underpins those judgments, underp- underpins that ability. And, and in linguistics, we're, we're interested in characterizing what that is. So you mentioned earlier that, you know, it seems that it's, it's, it's sort of philosophically and linguistically significant that it's possible for people to understand sentences that are composed of parts where they've never heard them before. Mm-hmm. Um, what kind of role would, would that kind of consideration play in thinking about innateness or thinking about maybe capacities we have to understand language? Yeah, so, um, so one sort of, like, maybe kind of an initial hypothesis about um, how meaning works in language or how we interpret things in language is that perhaps we're just dealing with sort of lists of phrases or lists of sentences and perhaps that's what's stored in our heads. Perhaps when we acquire whatever language we happen to acquire as children, we hear a bunch of sentences, phrases and sentences and we store them up along with, oh, that's what that means. 
That might be true, actually, for things like kick the bucket, for sort of set idioms, sort of set phrases that have a sort of a set meaning. Um, so kick the bucket for die. Perhaps that does actually get stored um, mentally in that way. Um, but that can't be what's going on with language in general. Um, if it were, then we wouldn't be able to explain the fact that we can understand sentences that we've never heard before. So instead, we must be dealing with something like an algorithm or a recipe which takes a sentence as its input and gives you back the meaning as its output. And that's what we're characterizing. Then the question that immediately comes up is, well, what, what, what's the meaning? You know, what does it mean to give the meaning of a sentence? Um, which is incredibly hard. Guy will probably back me up when I say that that is a sort of a hard question to answer. Um, one strategy is to say, well, what is it to know the meaning of a sentence? The example that I always give my students is that right now I don't know where my brother is. No idea where he is. So my brother's name is David. So if you give me the sentence, David is at home, I don't know what that sen whether that sentence is true or false. But I do know what the world would have to be like in order for the sentence to be true, right? I, I can sort of picture a situation in which the sentence David is at home is true, a situation in which he is in his house. Um, and I know what the world would be like for the sentence to be false. So the meaning of a sentence, you might think, is something like the conditions under which the sentence was, is true. So what does it take for the sentence to be true? That's, that's one way. Yeah, I've definitely have heard philosophers discuss these kind of things in terms of truth yeah. makers or truth conditions. conditions yeah, is yeah. that something you encounter a lot in, in beginning to sort of teach this stuff as well? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of standard way of treating uh, at least an aspect of meaning. I mean, from a philosophical perspective, one of the things that you want to understand is, is for example, the role of language in communication and in particular transmission of bits of information from one person to another. So it's in that kind of case, in the case that Hazel gave, I'm put in a position by her telling me, for example, that David's at home to figure out that David's at home. And the idea is roughly that I do that through a combination of knowing what she meant by saying that David's at home and trusting her, believing that what she said was correct or true. And the proposal that meanings are something, knowing the meaning is something like knowing the truth conditions figures perfectly there. If I know that in order for what Hazel said to be true, David has to be at home, and I know that just off the back of my competence with this bit of the language, then all I need to add to that is a view that Hazel's telling the truth to figure out where David is. So that's kind of a, a way of thinking about why that's a, a, a good way of beginning to think about meaning. Okay, so this all sounds quite commonsensical so far, but I am aware that your main business is in the sort of formal or sort of more technical underpinnings of grammar. Can you, okay. can you say a bit about why that's the kind of analysis you've gravitated towards or why you think it's important for understanding languages? Yeah, so, um, so it's turned out that um, sort of formal and mathematical tools have been incredibly um, fruitful in trying to carry out this project that we've, I guess, we've just been describing um, of trying to sort of characterize linguistic meaning and, and also characterize the kind of algorithm that, that underpins it, that um, sort of mental knowledge that underpins it. Um, maybe I'll, I'll kind of back up and, and say that sort of a kind of heuristic that's used in formal semantics or a sort of starting point for this is the, um, the thought that there are two key ingredients in um, determining what the meaning of a sentence is. Um, one is kind of obviously the meaning of the words that occur in the sentence and the second is the way in which those words are put together. So the kind of the combinatorics or what you might think of, this, of as the syntax, the, um, the, the structure of the sentence. Yeah, um, so, so, that's, so that goes back to the philosopher Gottlob Frege. The, it's called the principle of, com of compositionality. And so we take from that that um, the kind of input to semantic interpretation is going to be syntactic structures, which syntacticians tell us are hierarchically 
organized for syntax, and we're here, they could kind of elaborate on that. But rather than just sentences being kind of linear strings of word, they, words, they seem to have a kind of a hierarchical organization. And then the job of semantics, or one of the jobs of semantics, is to characterize the procedure for getting from that hierarchical structure to, uh, to meaning. And it turns out that that can be done fairly well with a pretty sort of limited, tightly limited set of what's called composition rules, so semantic rules for interpreting that input. So part of that idea is the idea that basically you can think of this in terms of functions in their arguments. So you can think of the meanings of verbs, let's say, as functions. So in uh, something like Sophie runs, run is going to be a function. That's going to be the meaning of the verb run, which I know sounds... When I first encountered that idea, I thought that was insane. But that is, <laughs> that is sort of what we think that run is doing in the, within that sentence. And then it takes, so the sentence was Sophie runs, and then it takes Sophie as its argument. And you can get by pretty well with pretty simple kind of logical machinery or mathematical machinery along those lines. Okay, so that's, so verbs can be a kind of function. And then yeah. are there any sort of classic examples of what, what happens when you get, I mean, it, is the more complicated a sentence is mm. in, let's say, the English language, does that mean that the, the sort of formal procedure for showing its underpinnings is going to be more complicated as well? Or Yeah, so, the, so, so what you hope and, and what tends to work out pretty nicely is that the rules themselves, you can kind of stick with that fairly limited set. Of course, the, the, the sort of longer the sentence, the, you know, the more the longer the analysis is going to be, and it's going to start to look, it's going to look complex and, and sort of be, you know, more and more difficult to understand. I suppose so. There's complexity in that sense, but a more substantive complexity, I guess, no, not really. It's it, you're still dealing with something, the ingredients of which are are, are fairly are fairly simple. So like a procedural kind of thing that you yeah, can just extend. Yeah. Are there yeah. any really famously tricky examples or ones that have really made, you know, formal semanticists in history, you know, scratch their heads? or Things that give us headaches. Or controversial yeah. ones that yeah. you will disagree on or anything like that? Yeah, yeah, of, of course, yeah. So um, I guess one thing that comes to mind is the um, is conditional sentences. So, so these are kind of if-then types of types of sentences. So... Um, something like, if you put sugar in your coffee, it will taste good. Okay, so let's suppose, let's just all take for granted that we like sugar in our coffee and we're willing to kind of get on board with that. Maybe that's a stretch, I don't know. But, but let's just sort of take that for granted. So it looks as though an if-then sentence, a conditional sentence, um, the meaning of that seems to be something like, something about, give me a set of circumstances where the first bit is true. So where you put sugar in your coffee, a set of situations that look like that, then the second bit is automatically going to be true as well. It's automatically going to follow. So in those situations where you have sugar in your coffee, going to follow from that unavoidably that the coffee is going to taste good. Should that sort of as a first pass, that seems like a fairly reasonable analysis, and that also happens to kind of correspond to what logicians would say the meaning of, of, the, of the arrow symbol is, yeah. the kind of formal logic sort of correspondent of, of, the, of, of that, of the conditional. But suppose that I put sugar in my coffee, but I also put vinegar in it, right? Then it doesn't taste good anymore. Having a weird morning. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> These are the experiments that semanticists like to do. So suppose, suppose for some reason that's what you decide to do. Then your coffee isn't going to taste good. So, so that's sort of an example of where, of where what looked like a fairly straightforward analysis starts to, starts to break down. And, you can, and, then you, and then you're sort of forced to give a more, a more complex analysis than it initially looked like. And, and actually, just to add to that, the example kind of brings out another, just I suppose in a way, a methodological point about doing semantics, or, which is that we sort of look to the scenarios that don't most readily come to mind. So the scenario, you know, if you talk about the original sentence I gave, so if you put sugar in your coffee, it will taste good. I first gave you sort of obvious scenarios that come to mind when you hear that sentence. 
to, re to sort of see what the limits are of our analyses, you, you need to go to the, the sort of weird scenarios. Um, and that's sort of where you start to, to see where analyses break down. So yeah, so, so we're kind of constantly discovering puzzles and, and, and finding problems. And sort of looking for perverse cases with which exactly, to... Exactly, yeah. I definitely think yeah. that's true of, you know, philosophy with yeah, thought yeah. experiments. It tends to be Very zombies, thing. goop, uh, just unusual sets of things that we're really worried about. So some of the people you mentioned, Frege you mentioned, is a big famous figure in the history of philosophy. We all study Frege if we do undergrads in philosophy, I think for the most part. I mean, are we interested in the same set of issues there, thinking about Frege? philosophers or is that you know is it similarly we're looking to him for a sort of formal semantics analysis or yeah I mean the the broad shape of the kind of technical machinery that we make use of and that Hazel's talking about making use of um, largely derives from from Frege's work so he gave he, he developed a very kind of rich powerful elegant logical system that could then be exploited for a variety of purposes, right? I mean, his own interest was trying to account for ar arithmetic, um, but but it's he also put this machinery to use in trying to understand bits of language, and, and linguists still do. I mean, bro broadly the same kind of machinery. It's not so. I mean, it's not clear that Frege himself was terribly interested in ordinary language, in in what ordinary folks know. Um, he was he was a kind of a, a reviser. He'd have been happier to make use of some kind of uh, ideal logical language rather than worry about the kinds of glitches that, that theorists like Hazel are interested in studying when they come to study ordinary natural languages. But but broadly, uh, projects in the same in the same ballpark. So yeah, I think this is what Frege is interested in: a, a world where people are literally just mapping arguments to. <laughs> to other things, right? And, you know, these kind of the structure of the sentences he's interested in seem to have this, yeah, this assertorial quality. Mm -hmm. um, Dick, I don't know if you want to join in on some of the, the introductory yes. stuff here. Is, is... Yeah, I, 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 go, I go along with, with, with all of that. Um, <clears throat> but I think there's a lot more to language than the truth conditional side of it. And I think it's important really to, I, I'm, a, I'm a linguist, uh, a linguistician, I prefer to say. Uh, so I, I'm basically in, uh, interested in looking at language as it is, um, in, in, in all of its fine, fine detail and mess. And language is very messy. And uh, so I, I, I think it's important to see language as a, uh, an example of social activity and mental activity. And that, looks, that makes it look rather different from when you're abstracting it away and seeing it simply as a formal system. Uh, so, for example, suppose I said, I wouldn't be at all surprised if it didn't rain tomorrow. You wouldn't bat an eyelid, would you? But it's actually nonsense. What I really mean I, is, I wouldn't be surprised if it rained tomorrow. And there's a, a sort of a redundant knot that's crept in and I think that's probably as a result of, of how we process language through, with spreading activations spilling over from one verb to the next. So the first verb is negative, I, I wouldn't be surprised. And, and so by the time you get to the second verb, you've still got sort of negation in your mind and you, and you make the second verb negative as well. It's a kind of agreement. And it only happens with surprise, maybe astonished as well. But, um, but it's important to, to, to remember that that's an example of the, the social side of language, where if other people around us go around saying nonsense, then we'll go around saying nonsense as well, and we won't think twice about it. And, and so when, when we're processing, when we're actually processing sentences, uh, I think we're, 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 we are using an algorithm like the one that Hazel was, was talking about there, but I think we're, we're, we're using it in the context of, a, of, a, of the, our total knowledge that, that we've got active at the time of, of processing. So if you have the, uh, the example, um, time flies like an arrow and fruit flies like a banana, <laughs> which is from the Marx Brothers. Now, I find that absolutely, actually painful mentally painful. It's, a, it's called a garden path sentence. It, it, the, the point being that the two sentences the, that are coordinated there actually have totally different structures. You, and you embark on them because you think you, you expect the second sentence to follow the pattern of the first sentence, again spreading activation and so on, um, uh, but it doesn't. And, and, and so you, it's, it's, a, it's a joke. Uh, and you're, and you're, you're meant to laugh, it was the Marx Brothers. 
uh, it, uh, let me just repeat it just so you can so you can get the point of it. Time flies, verb, like an arrow, prepositional phrase. Fruit flies, that's flies, noun, fruit flies, uh, like a banana, <laughs> where like is the verb and uh, in the second one, but it's the the preposition in the first one. So it's it's it's. Uh, what, we're do, what we're actually doing when we're processing sentences, understanding sentences, um, is, is, is very much more complicated, I think, than, than it is, is a very enriched version of the, of the algorithm. But, but I guess, I, guess I, I entirely agree with that. But one thought is that if you think about everything that's going on when someone understands a piece of language, it's going to be enormously, enormously complicated, Absolutely. so complicated that you might wonder whether it's going to be conceivable to have any kind of controlled, tractable theory mm. of what's going on. You know, in ordinary cases, I mean, even taking Hazel's simple case, the kind of knowledge that goes into knowing who David is in a way that would put me in a position to figure out what I was being told by being told that David's at home looks like it could conceivably draw on almost anything that I know. Yes. So, so I guess one, one worry people might have at that stage is that it's better to kind of divide and conquer and that one might yeah. be able to achieve nice theory if one, without, without assuming one's covering everything, one might be able to get nice theory if one hives off from the mess that is um, people speaking online and tries to figure out how bits of their capacity might work. I guess that's how I kind of think of the sort of theorising that Hazel yeah, was talking I mean, about. Exactly. I mean, there was a bit of theorising already, or sort of a bit of theorising that's more familiar to, or more akin to what I do in the, the kind of description that you gave, I think, where you sort of made reference to the syntactic categories of, of yes. the words in the, in the fruit flies example. And it's, it's a component of the story of, of what sure. goes wrong with the sure. garden. And plant, you've got to start somewhere. And, 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 yeah. Well, it's, it's, I mean, it's a bit like understanding the universe, isn't it? I mean, it's, you've got to start somewhere. You can't, mm -hmm. And you can't... <laughs> You can't do the whole thing in one go. <laughs> no, you've got to. But but it's important if you're going to do that. If you're going to see this as a research strategy, rather than you've got to make sure that you see you, that that's how you present it, and you don't present it as the facts. This is how language works. Mm -hmm. So you you you've, we we have to be modest in our claims, I suppose. It starts to make the learning of a language look like an incredibly, you know, impressive achievement. I mean, if you think there are these pieces of rote learning you need to do, say, kick the bucket, or these kind of phrases that like no amount of sitting and thinking about kicking and buckets is going to get you to, oh, that's an idiom for somebody who's died. And you've got these kind of formal understandings that come from thinking about structure, and then these sort of conventional rules that slip in, in ways that allow people to sort of practically violate, I guess, what we would think of as formal rules. Uh, I, you know, it's not something we discussed earlier, but I mean, AI, does this play into? I mean, how could you teach a sort of system to, I mean, obviously it seems to be a complicated thing that we manage to do uh, via a load of different routes of learning, but, you know, how can, I mean, do linguists discuss this and philosophers, what, you know, how you could possibly try and make a machine, you know? Can I should Please. Yeah. Un unfortunately, this is, this, is, this is a real disaster story for linguistics. Um, because, um, I mean, if you, go, if you look at any of the machinery that's available on Google for tra Google Translate or, or, or in instant uh, transcription systems and so on, they're brilliantly successful, but they don't build on linguistics. <laughs> that, that, uh, that they, they all build on, on, on very, very large databases of, of statistics. Uh, of what's like when, when you when you've heard the following two sent two words, what's the next word likely to be, and so on, which is not how linguists think of language at all. And uh, it was all a lot of the groundwork was done in IBM New, uh, New York by a, a team led by a chap who 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 boasted that every time he fired a linguist, productivity went up. <laughs> <laughs> So I, th I think what we're hoping what we're hoping for is that the next generation of word process of, of natural language processing and, and, and speech recognition and so on will actually close the gap at the top. But there's, there's still sort of four, four, four percent error or something like that, and that and four percent of, of mistakes is a hell of a lot of mistakes, yeah. which we wouldn't tolerate in ordinary conversation at all. 
Uh, so that, that's that's a real problem, and and I think what linguists are probably thinking at the moment is that, well, they're not going to close that gap until they actually take linguistics seriously and actually try to build uh, language processing machinery into uh, artificial intelligence models of, 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 not, of, of general knowledge and so on and so forth. And yeah. why, why do you think that that is? I mean, so, so you're saying I agree with you that, that there's this kind of ter- terrible kind of mismatch or a terrible kind of failure of linguistics to kind of ha- have an influence in, in this sort of work. Why, why do you think <coughs> that's being... Good question. I have no idea. Yeah. Um, uh, the productivity, I mean, apparently. Well, well you, 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 it, the, the, the statistical approach works. Um, at, at least it works well enough to, 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 to persuade funders that it's worth investing very large amounts of money in. Um, uh, it, yes, indeed. But as, as you said, it doesn't work nearly as well as, as, maybe the, as yeah. infants do at the, at the task of acquiring a language. It's a very good question. I, I, I mean, maybe, maybe the answer is that linguistics can only sell its formal structures and, and its, its abstract theories uh, if it combines those with similar structures and sim- similar theories of, of, of general knowledge, well, I, I mean, I mean, one thought would be that um, it's it's very interesting that you can build a, a machine that, in in effect, delivers up something like translation through brute force, right? Through yes. just sifting an enormous database and then figuring out comparative probabilities mm. can deliver up something that's that's useful. In, in, in this way. But I guess, as I understand at least one core project in linguistics, the project isn't simply to design a system that's able to do that, in which, at which point it would be in direct competition with this kind of brute force mm-hmm. machinery. Rather, it's to understand how we, in fact, do do it. Um, and, and going a bit further, thinking about, about the acquisition question that Claire was pushing, mm-hmm. um, how we come to be in a position to do it. And as far as, as far as I think anyone knows, we don't do it by anything close to brute force. Uh, and one, one way of seeing that is, is to look at the kind of database that these large machines that people like Google are exploiting make use of. So they're looking at, I don't know, billions and billions of sentences in their, in their corpora. Um, whereas a child can come to the kind of competence, I mean, be- superior competence um, to one of these machines in the space of a very in a very short space of time and on the basis of what must be far more limited exposure to data um, so so we have all kinds of evidence for thinking that um, this isn't so bad for for linguists given that their project isn't simply to design translation machinery yes. I don't know if maybe the audience is miles ahead of me on this, but I, I don't understand how the data set approach works. Is there a way to explain sort of easily what, what Google Translate is doing when it's sifting? It? It's basically exploiting the statistics of the data set, yeah. but, but in ways that, you know, if I knew how to do it, then I'd be working for Google. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's very sophisticated and, uh, and, and uh, it's not just looking at one word at a time and then looking at the next word and so on. It's standing back from the whole thing and saying, well, what's the most likely overall analysis of this sentence? I guess that would explain why, it, so I, famously, it's quite bad with the Irish language, which is obviously not a, a terribly widely spoken language, but maybe I guess there's, there's, more, there's less stuff to work from, so they don't have... Okay, that makes sense. Okay, at this point, do we have any questions? Okay, one in the middle straight, straight away there. Uh, I'm going to take them in groups. So this person in the white right in the middle. The, um, the perspectives around how uh, linguistics come together in the anatomy of language really interested me when we were speaking of uh, the age of the machine. And my question is really relating to um, if the human language is fit for purpose for the age of the machine, and should we be overlaying and being romantic about the human language that we've been used to um, with the age of what we're going into with AI and uh, singularity. Okay, thank you so much. And then just this person here, and yeah, then afterwards this gentleman. Hi, I don't know what the official term would be for this, but I was wondering what linguistics is doing with kind of the idea of categories. I'm thinking of the whole a white horse is not a horse paradox and kind of like what if there are any debates happening in regards to that? 
Okay, thank you very much. And just, yeah. Um, I wondered why the title of tonight's uh, conference is Anatomy of a Language when really you're talking about all the time seems to be language in general rather than French or Irish. True. Well, I feel like that might be my fault, the last one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so just to summarise them for the podcast that's coming out, um, the first question is on perspectives in the age of the machine. So is human language fit for purpose or should we be looking at different uh, sort of to different sources for coping with singularity. Second question to do with linguistic categories. So white horse is not a horse. I guess it's sort of toy cases that you maybe challenge the picture. And then the third, I mean, anatomy of a language. I guess, you know, we, we can talk about both a, a language in general, but also different languages. But I, I certainly didn't mean to prefigure things too much by pushing. It certainly won't be just the Irish language anyway. Um, so anyone, please feel free to take up anything. I wouldn't mind picking up on the third one. Um, so, so maybe what, what's perhaps underlying the question, I don't know, is, is there's kind of a tension, there's definitely a tension in how, how I was talking that I was describing a project of investigating, let's say, English, or I think I used one example about German, German word order and talking in terms of um, coming up with a descriptive characterization of the grammar of that language. But my kind of bigger picture interests are about sort of language capital L without, without A or even without the in front of it. Um, and, so, and so there's a sort of a tacit assumption, I suppose, underlying that, that you can make inferences about the nature of language as a whole and in turn about the nature of the faculty of language, so the, that mental ability that, that we've been talking about, on the basis of data from a particular language. And that is, in a sense, what we're doing in linguistics. So um, much of the research in linguistics, people tend to be surprised by this, but much of the research in formal linguistics is simply on English. Um, and then you might worry, well, there's sort of, what, 7,000 languages spoken in the world at the moment. How justified is it to assume that we can extrapolate from a single language, which is essentially chosen for convenience, it's a language where we have access, easy access to native speakers, we're extrapolating from that to broad generalizations. Um, and in fact, even people talk in terms of universals, so we want to make claims about what's universal across all languages. And I guess, so a couple, a couple of things that come to mind. So, so perhaps one thing to say is, is that sort of looking at a single language is only ever going to be a first step. Um, and then you sort of start to look at different languages. And when you do that, you, find, you do find variation. So you find variation in where the verb goes in German compared to English and all sorts of different things. But you also find remarkable um, uniformity, um, astonishing uniformity. Um, so I'll give you an example of that. So um, if you think one of the languages that was, sorry, one of the, the linguistic expressions that semanticists like to think about is the tiny little word ever, as in um, I haven't ever been to Spain, let's say. Um, that likes to occur next to the word not, or the, the, the negation. Uh, it can occur in some other contexts as well. It cannot occur in simple positive sentences. I have ever been to Spain is unacceptable. So I haven't ever been to Spain. Fine. I have ever been to Spain. It's unacceptable. You might wonder, is that just a feature of English? And it turns out not to be. So this turns out to be something that is broadly replicated across um, the other languages that linguists have looked at. And by now, language, linguists have looked at lots of different languages. And so there's, there's definitely a kind of a tension there when, when you're sort of focus in great, great depth on a single language, and your null hypothesis very often is this is going to replicate in other languages, and sometimes it won't, and then you have to revise your theories, but a lot of the time it will, um, which then 
tells us perhaps something about what's universal and, and maybe even what's what's innate. I don't I don't know if that helps with the question at all. Oh, thank you. And then any thoughts on language in the age of machines or uh, sort of linguistic categories like white horse is not a horse? Uh, sure. So, uh, about the first question I, I thought was an interesting one. Uh, well, they're all interesting, but the, the first one was uh, it resonated with me. Uh, should we be uh, considering looking for non-natural human languages uh, for use in the in, in the 21st century? And uh, I think the answer is that yes, we, and we are already doing them. Doing that, I mean. The, the mathematics has its has its own very specialised language, uh, to, which is so specialised that, that, that I, I can't understand a word of it. Uh, uh, although it's, it can be read in English and so on, um, uh, that's the, the written version. And 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 I think that uh, humans are one, one of the uh, interesting capacities of hu of the human mind is to invent is to go beyond ordinary language to invent. New ways of communication when, when when there's a need for it. If you try to use natural language or ordinary language, um, you you hit a, a problem pretty quickly. Um, and there's a, a very interesting example of that in on, on the internet. If you look at the the language of the internet, um, there's there's an area of semantics called dyxis which is based on the, the campfire scene where you've got a bunch of people sitting around a campfire and talking to each other and each of them um, knows who all the others are. Everybody knows who's talking at any given time. And so we've got pronouns like I and you and uh, place, place, d d d descriptions of places like here and times, now. And so on, and these these are all defined in relation to the to the the situation of utterance. So, so as far as we're, we're concerned in this uh, in this little group here, we all know exactly who we are, and we and and you all know that I'm the person who's talking now, Dick Hudson, and so on. Um, but if you look at the internet, it, it, all hell has broken loose. Uh, the, the, there's total confusion about Dyxis. Um, if you look on, on, on any website, you can find my so-and-so up in the top right-hand corner, my account. And then in the middle of the page, you'll have, uh, what do you want me to tell you? <laughs> Where in, in, in one case, uh, I uh, am, am, am the, the speaker. In the other person, in the other case, I am the, 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 the addressee, the person being spoken to. Um, and, and, and this is, this is uh, an issue that, uh, that the, that in, no doubt will eventually resolve itself through, through, um, negotiation and, 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 and uh, people b becoming more and more influential and, and, and fix, and, and coming to, uh, some kind of resolution. But, uh, it's an example of the, the need for a special language uh, or special linguistic uh, arrangements, anyway, uh, to to suit special circumstances. Okay, so yeah, that medium has sort of drawn a, a set of new problems and questions. Absolutely, yeah. Oh, did you want to say something? Yeah, just just wanted to add something. I mean, I mean, I mean, an aspect of this question is a question about what function or functions of languages are. Um, so, so addressing that question would make a difference to how one wanted to go about addressing the question whether natural languages are fit for purpose. It will depend a lot what the purposes are. Uh, and one, one aspect of this that connects up with some of the things we were talking about earlier is um, acquiring facility with these languages, so, so coming to have, have particular languages. So what, what it looks like you'll find uh, uh, is that children are primed. I mean, the reason natural languages have the features they have is because children are primed to acquire languages with those features. Um, and, it, and if that's right, and, and there's you know, fairly strong evidence that something like that is right, then what you're likely to find is that insofar as you attempt to depart from those common features of natural languages in constructing um, one of these new languages, it might be perfectly possible for people to acquire the languages, but they'll have to make use of something like their general intellectual abilities rather than the purpose-built um, machine that enables them to acquire 
first, typically first natural languages. I mean, the, the kinds of, part of the evidence for, for that kind of nativism claim, I mean, it's peripheral part of the evidence, is what happens when you try and teach children um, to make use of languages that don't fit the moles of natural languages as far as we understand it. What happens in effect is that the children just ignore the bits of the language you're trying to teach them that don't fit the structures they're primed to acquire and instead acquire a, a naturalized version that gives up on those differences. So that's not to say it's impossible to have a completely novel language. It's just that if one of the things you care about is exploiting the fact that humans, as things stand, are built to acquire a fairly limited range of such systems, then that will be something that will feed into your calculations, into what matters when you're trying to come up with such proposals, I think. Okay, so I'm also, so one sort of connecting thought here might be to do with vocabulary. You know, this might be the kind of thing that maybe children choose to ignore if it doesn't seem relevant. <laughs> It's also one of these terms that is a common sense one that maybe has a different use among linguists and people who theorize. So how should we think about the role of, of vocabulary in all of this? Yeah, um, the, the, the fact is that we, 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 we've all grown up in a, in a culture in which we can go into a shop and buy a dictionary or a grammar, and those are two different books. So we're very strongly uh, predisposed to, to think of grammar and vocabulary, vocabulary is what you find in dictionaries, basically, um, as, as, as very different uh, kinds of information about a language. Um, uh, a, a lot of linguists now question the distinction uh, uh, and, and think that vocabulary is simply very specific grammar, and grammar is just rather generalized vocabulary. Um, because when, when, nobody has actually come up ever with a, with a clear uh, set, set of criteria for distinguishing between the between grammar and vocabulary. And if you look at if you look at a modern dictionary, you'll find that it gives a lot of information about grammar, about uh, uh, how how words change their forms when they change their meanings and that kind of thing. And 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 if you look at a modern grammar, it gives you a, a hell of a lot of information about individual like, uh, individual uh, words. So uh, uh, I, th I think any discussion of, of, of grammar inevitably has, has to broaden out and, and, and so that it includes all the kinds of information that we, that we have traditionally thought of as being to do with vocabulary. Um, and my, my view is that, that, that basic, the basic unit of language is the word uh, rather than the sentence. And, and, um, uh, and, and so, in, in a sense, grammar is simply uh, generalized information about words, and, um, and, and vocabulary is just words. So, I mean, if we think about meaning, as Hazel was discussing it earlier, as sort of connected maybe to words and the way they function in sentences, does more vocab mean more meanings? Or, yeah, I mean, yes, how should, yes, okay. absolutely, yes. I mean, the, the word is the point where me, mean, meaning meets sound, uh, and words are the units that basically bring together meanings with uh, sounds, typically. Okay, and then I suppose one thing we try and do with words often is translate them into different languages. So I wonder, does anyone have any thoughts on sort of the role of the linguist in thinking about how translations work or maybe anxieties about the ability of translations and transliterations to capture? I mean, you often hear classic examples about Icelandic has lots of words for snow or you know, Irish crack, you know, doesn't mean a drug or a bridge, but it's hard to explain exactly what it means. Uh, how, do, how do linguists start to think about translating and the, the issues there? My view is that, is that diversity is everywhere and, and languages, uh, well, even within a language, you don't find uniformity in, in, in meanings of, attached to words. And um, there are a hell of a lot of words in a language that, that are very, very sort of culture specific or, or, or uh, cozy, <laughs> fair, party even is, is, is quite hard to, to translate into a lot of languages. And, um, and, and so I, I, my view is that, 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 that um, la between languages you find a, a, a lot of mismatch between the meanings of words. Uh, and within languages, you find a lot of uh, interpersonal diversity or, or even me uh, complete uncertainty and chaos uh, in, in the meanings that we attach to words. Like money, like the word meaning. 
Do you have any thoughts yeah, on that? Yeah, so um, kind of work that I do, I think we tend to be kind of share that sort of skepticism about about translation. Um, and for instance, when semanticists sort of go out and do field work on the semantics of other languages, you're not going to get your work published if you sort of say, oh, well, the speaker told me that the English translation of, of this uh, of the sentence is this, so this, therefore, this is what what this means. And so then there's a sort of, a, I guess, a methodological question about how how do you how how do, if translation isn't going to be the thing that that does it, then how how are you going to get at uh, me, meaning in in another language? Which let's say, so an example is I, I work on the West African language Ewe, which is um, spoken in Togo and Ghana, and uh, I'm not a native speaker of the language, so if I'm not going to be relying on translation, how am I ever going to sort of uncover information about the meanings of the sentences of interest in that language? And it sort of goes back to this idea of truth conditions. And if we think about meaning in terms of truth conditions, then you can set up little scenarios and ask your consultant is the sentence true or false in, the, in that scenario and then you can kind of use that as a starting point for making inferences about the meaning of the sentence or the word that you're that you're interested in um, but it's a very tough problem of course mm. yeah. Guy, any thoughts or no that's all entirely accurate <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we talked a lot about like des descriptive grammar. Um, I'm quite interested in, in thinking about prescriptive grammar for a minute as well. So we think about grammar as a thing that uh, has a sort of political aspect as well. So there's a way in which people think about, you know, good grammar as a mark of, you know, a certain kind of learning or a certain kind of education or upbringing maybe. Uh, you know, I'm interested in your insights in, in how helpful it is to police people's grammar or, you know, what you see is going on when people are correcting grammar. To police grammar. Yeah, think. or to be correcting people in a kind of, in a way, especially where they've been understood, to be to be hopping in to say that some part of what has been understood was incorrect. Um, somebody once gave me a, a cartoon, I can't remember where it was from, of uh, somebody saying, look out, here come the grammar police. <laughs> and they gave it to me because they knew that I was a grammarian and they thought that, that it would resonate with me. I, I hated it, but... <laughs> um, if, if you're an anthropologist, you don't go in, into, a, in, into a culture in order to decide whether it's right or wrong. You just take it as it, as it comes and, 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 and try to make sense of it. And, and I think that's what we, what, that's our role. Is we, we sort of sign a, uh, swear a Hippocratic oath, don't we, when we join? <laughs> so saying, I, I, I will never try to change the system. Um, and, and I think that's not a bad, that's not and good luck person. trying as well. I think yeah. that's the other side of it. <laughs> you know, it's it's not sort of within our purview to be able to do it's, this, it will be even if we wanted time. to. Yes, yeah. yeah. Because there are such strong social pressures to, um, to, to that, that, are, that are pushing language along. Uh, that, that that if if the if the uh, everybody says that the Académie Française has no 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 influence at all, and I think if we had a, a similar academy which was trying to stop change, which is basically what it would be trying to do. It would be a total waste of time. I mean, who is in charge? You know, I'm just wondering about, you know, ending a sentence in a preposition. We have all of these kind of rules that we might associate with more antiquated ways of communicating. I don't think it is such a problem to end sentences and prepositions anymore. It's certainly not something you see, or it's, you see it happening in writing in the public sphere more often. So, I mean, I'm just wondering, is there a good theory or you know, what is happening when sort of standards of strictness in grammar change is that, you know, presumably there isn't some one council for grammar who's sending out annual bulletins. Well, that's a bad example because prepositions have always ended in sentences in English. I mean, ever, ever, ever since Old English, uh, well, since Middle English anyway, uh, there have been stranded prepositions. So it, what, what happened was in the 18th century was that people tried to stop it because, because it's not, it, that's not possible in Latin, it's not possible in French, therefore it shouldn't be possible in English. Um, and so it was, that was a misguided attempt to change English uh, from the way that English was. I mean, Shakespeare is full of the, uh, prepositions at the end of, uh, of the sentence. So, so um, what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, should, should we be trying to police language? 
I, I don't think we should be trying to police language. I, 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 I think we, we have a role in actually improving language, filling, filling some gaps that where, where, where intervention might be possible. For example, the, the names of the letters of the alphabet, you didn't expect to hear me say that, did you? But the, the, the letters of the alphabet are part, are part of the English language, and, and, the, and each one has a name, and the names are total chaos. And, and, we, and, and, we, and people have, have, to, have developed systems for replacing the standard names by other names, Charlie and so on and so forth, which I, I, I can't cope with. They, they use them because on the telephone, you lose all the high frequencies, and so, uh, therefore you can't tell the difference between f and th and s. And so, so, so I think linguists could intervene here by saying, look, here's a, here's a rational set of names for the letters of the alphabet, let's use them. They could intervene on punctuation a lot. Punctuation is a mess. Nobody knows how to punctuate bullet points, for example. <laughs> and that's again something where, where we could actually suggest a set, a set of standards which, which, which would have some kind of rationale. But I think on the, on the, at the heart of language, it's, it's just a waste of time. It's a waste of time and, and also um, I, I think it, it is sort of demonstrable that there are harms that are done by adhering to sort of prescriptive, sort of quite often mistaken sort of prescriptive norms of grammar. So one case um, that linguists have discussed quite a bit is um, if, if you're familiar with the Trayvon von Martin case from I think something like seven years ago, 17-year-old um, African-American boy who was uh, murdered while walking down the street and the key witness in the in the case happened to be a speaker of African-American English who was on the phone to him at the time when he died and her testimony was was sort of discredited there was a kind of a backlash and reaction that this was a person who did not spoke did not speak proper English and therefore was unintelligent and therefore unreliable because of the fact that she spoke African-American English, which is highly stigmatized, is perceived to be something like English with slang or a sort of an inferior form of English. Um, but in fact, li linguistic research has shown that it's a, a system in its own right. It's a, a variety of English which happens to have somewhat different grammatical rules from the variety of English that I speak but there's no objective criterion on which to judge it as, as, as sort of better or worse. Um, so I think it's worth kind of flagging that, that these kind of pres this sort of prescriptive attitude towards language can do and has done quite, quite real harms. Yeah, so I suppose that's what I meant to get at with the sort of political dimension of it, which is that, you know, in the case you mentioned, it seems like there's an inference from failing to adhere to very strict norms of grammar to something like either a lack of deference or a lack of intelligence, maybe, or a lack of reliability in a way that really damages people. So maybe, you know, it's natural to think that uh, a sort of broadening of the or, you know, a, a broadening of, of appreciation for the different ways in which people communicate and the different sort of uh, linguistic aspects they bring to bear is, is sort of helpful to various liberation projects. Um, okay, I think we do have another question, at least one, but then we have absolutely loads. All right, so he had his hand up about 20 minutes ago, so the shirt collar there. Hey, uh, yeah, just to bring it back to descriptive linguistics for, for a sec. So yeah, um, my question's about how language is represented um, in the human brain. Is it like symbolic or is it physiological so obviously anyone who studies linguistics knows that there's this like big beef between like formal linguistics like Chomsky fans like hand up for a Chomsky <laughs> we just fan. get a whoop for Chomsky in the audience <laughs> yeah. um, versus um psychologists and connectionists and all that sort of stuff by B stuff um that's an interesting just alludes to what you guys were talking about about computational models of language and I think it was mentioned that it's like a brute force thing um, you know, these, uh, these babblefish things. And some people, some psychologists look at the brain like that. They think that it's, you know, it's all patterns, statistical models and that sort of thing. And most people, if you study linguistics, like linguistic linguistics, then you don't like that because we like to think it's all rule based and we've got algorithms and efficient systems in the brain which generate like an infinite number of sort of possibilities. But so my question's about like, okay. Generative linguistics, you know, you've got syntax, like um, phonology, morphology, the beautiful aspect of linguistics, which we love to study. And then we look at the amazing variation amongst all the millions of languages 
that I've ever been, is that stuff valid in terms of how, it rep- how language is represented in the brain? Because I think there's a growing I sort of thought here that language is actually just patterns and connectionism and all that sort of stuff, and that produces language as we see it in all its variety and beauty, and then the way in which we study the product of that brain is by having all these kind of sophisticated models of language, you know, like basically generative linguistics, the Chomsky era, which is it's beautiful, it's mathematical, it's, it's so nice to romanticize it, but realistically, is that how language is represented in the brain? And you know you had this X-bar theory thing, it's like, come on, that's not how language is represented in the brain. It's, it's beautiful, but let's be real here, like, look at the brain as not this like mathematical, it's not a machine, it's not okay. a computer. Now you're making my job of summarising this question pretty difficult. <laughs> basically, um, okay, but I will do basically, my best. Basically, okay. how do you guys reconcile the psychologists coming and ruining the party? Okay, thank you so much. And this woman here, please. Much simpler. Um, regarding the policing of language, as I've got older, it bothers me that people say funny things which don't make sense. For example, when people say... Um, I could care less. I think they mean I couldn't care less, but they now say I could care less. I think it's American. And I'm... I <laughs> may not be. Okay. And, and for example, all my hobby horses now, a few... I love um, that you've brought a list of grievances horses. with you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Things like the prepositions, not, not ending sentences, but when people say different to... I thought it was different from because it's moving away from something. So it makes sense to me that's what I was taught 100 years ago, different <laughs> from. People now don't say different from, and I'm wondering, doesn't, doesn't it bother people? Um, also, you've lo- we've lost the, the um, stress in some words there. For example, there's the word contribute, but contribution. The word complex, but complexity. Not complex, but it's complex and complexity. Now, that's all gone now, so people only have the stress in this one place now. Is that a good thing? Or, I mean, I just think language is richer when we have that difference. And I won't do very much more, but um, (laughs) the other one is um, when I say I'm fed up with something, I'm thinking like you feed somebody with something, you don't feed somebody of something. So if you say I'm fed up of that, which I know is what most people say, that seems to have changed as well. It's all to do with my age. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I think it sounds like it's to do with the way you were maybe taught as well, that you just, you know, that... <laughs> okay, well, here I go trying to summarize. I think the main kernel of the first series of questions was to do with the role of the brain in all of this, and can uh, a lot of these theor- theoretical models uh, capture things that we think involve certain psychological relationships between language users and language in an adequate way? Um, the second question, how to feel maybe about certain grievances about language. So I guess there's a legitimate question about at some point does I I could care less, just start to mean I couldn't care less if that's how people are using it. So maybe we could... It doesn't say, it's wrong logically, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, logically, it's wrong. Mm. If you're trying to say, I don't care about that, and I really, really don't care about it, you would want to say, I couldn't care less. Could mm. not care. Okay, well, let's see what the, uh, what the panel have to say. <laughs> I feel your pain. <laughs> All right. Could you care less? Yeah, so I'm... So <laughs> I'll confess, and I'm hesitating to confess it because I'm being recorded, but I will confess that I could care less does sort of bother me as well. But it bothers me... It bothers me because of, because of the sort of intuition that you're having, that it, does, it, it doesn't seem... There's a sort of a mismatch between what I would take to be the meaning of that sentence and the, the meaning that the speaker has in mind. Um, but how fascinating that that mismatch has has arisen. How fascinating. Would you just, I mean, take the mic because the, we want to hear you on the podcast. Oh, is that a, well, she's to, she's calling people lazy. Oh, so she's so she's she's ascri- so she's ascribing that to to laziness. Um, I'm not sure how we would go about investigating the hypothesis that that's how 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 that came about. Um, so widely said now that you can just imagine. I, 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 I take it to be something that that is a feature of of American English and um, and has kind of made its way over here because of kind of cultural influences. 
that mismatch, you know, that sort of perceived kind of mismatch between what I take to be the, the, what for me is the meaning of that sentence and what that speaker intends to say, I don't think that that gives me the right to ascribe anything to that speaker other than that they have a slightly different idiolect, a slightly different grammar of English from, from what I do. And there's no real sort of way of um, justifying the claim that my English is superior to their English because, because of this sort of small difference um, between, between the way that, that the two of us speak. Um, perhaps, perhaps one sort of way that one might attempt to sort of justify that claim is by saying that it's illogical, um, which I think, I think was what you were sort of getting at. Um, but there's all sorts of things uh, in natural language that people, that people have described as illogical. So, so, so the charge of illogicality is something that's often given to um, double negation. Um, so you didn't mention the word never. You, no, when no. You but so so negation, example... negation plays a role in that too. But so 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 if we do if we do something like double negation, so if we do something like nobody saw nothing, right? Now that gets described as illogical because you're you're saying no, but you're trying to say nobody, you're intending to say nobody uh, nobody saw anything, but logically you would think that two negations make a positive. And it's interesting to me that people sort of make that charge about um, what's called multicultural London English, which is a, a, dialect, of, uh, a dialect of English spoken um, by some speakers from London, and that has that feature of double negation. It's also a feature of African-American English, but it's also a feature of uh, Romance languages, right? So it's also a feature of Italian and French that they have two little pieces rather than one that they use in order to signal negation. And nobody ever sort of launches the charge of illogicality or the charge of laziness at speakers of French or, or Italian. And the only explanation that I can think of for that is that French and Italian are held in greater esteem for what are probably historical and cultural reasons, social reasons, than African-American English and multicultural London English. So in the end, these things are much more sort of, I think much more political in nature than they appear on the surface. I mean, one, one interesting kind of reflex of this issue, it just, just came to mind through your kind of disgust at, at, at certain ways of speaking. Because I, well, I, well I, <laughs> I, I, I can feel, I, one can have a certain kind of moderately visceral reaction to um, <laughs> things that, from one's own perspective, violate certain kinds of grammatical rules. And that, I just think it's kind of an interesting fact that an aspect of our engagement with language can involve these kinds of responses. I think, I think there are all kinds of explanations for that, and lots of them are political. But, but one aspect of the, of the overarching issue has to do with questions about what the function of natural languages are. And, and in particular, what the function of differences amongst natural languages, including these fairly fine-grained differences of, amongst kind of idiolects or dialects. Because um, there's a kind of natural thought, which is that language is for, the purpose of language is for communication. So what you want is for language to be as common as po I mean, the language you speak to be as common as possible, so you can easily exploit its resources in order to communicate quickly and fluently with with other people. But there's an interesting counter hypothesis driven by, in part, by the fact of fine grained differences, right? The multiplicity of, of natural languages and the fine grained differences amongst them, which is that f a, an aspect of that function could be coding, right? So, so what's important isn't that I'm able to communicate with a wide range of people, it's that I'm able to communicate precisely with my particular group. And moreover, I'm able to spot outsiders very straightforwardly because they say, I could care less, and so forth. So, so I, I'm just kind of wondering, you know, this is purely conjectural, but I, but I wonder whether one aspect of, of the kind of quasi-emotional response we can have to certain kinds of violations here might have to do with the way in which detection of those kinds of differences 
figures in our in our kind of past. I wonder if we could we could discuss the question about the brain, obviously, because that's something we haven't really discussed yet. Did you? Or did, did oh, you sorry. Yeah, yeah. I was going to actually put those the, 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 the two questions together Ooh, um, because um, <clears throat> your, your, your example is very similar to the one that I gave earlier about. Uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it didn't rain. Um, uh, and in both cases, the, the, the number of neg negations is wrong. There's, there's either too many or too too few. Um, and it, it seems to me that, that the, uh, for, for a linguist, for a linguistician, um, the, the real question is why? Why, why does that happen? Can we, how, how do we make sense of it? <clears throat> Given that it, it, it obviously doesn't make sense. It's a silly thing to say. Why do we say it? Why do people say it? And um, it, what, what I was suggesting before was that, that, that it's to do with um, the way that we process language. Uh, interpreted in terms of spreading activation in a network. Now that brings that brings us back to to your question: Can we can we think of language in formal terms as as a symbolic system, or, or do we have to, uh, to to accept the connectionist models, <coughs> which are very popular and which are a bit like the IBM version of approach to translate to machine translation? And um, it seems to me that the answer is that we need both that we need a model of the brain where you've got activation sloshing around following neural pathways and so on, but we also need a symbolic system, a, a mind, a model of the mind, which is built on top of that, where you've got a, one node per concept, which you don't have in the, in, in the brain. Does, uh, does the, the formal symbolic thing have any physical reality? Or is it just something that we use to sure, make sense in, of? In the same way that, that, that a cell has a, has a physical reality in biology, yeah. even though it's made up of atoms. You know, you've got, you've got layers of representation. You've got the, 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 the neural layer here with the, the mental layer on, sitting on top of it, uh, we, 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 underpinned by the, the uh, neural uh, realities, but just as real, but, uh, but a different kind of level of description. Cool. Thanks. Okay, thanks. I make two two quick comments. So, so the first is is I mean it's consistent with with what was just said. First is just that I think we don't know anything like enough about anything to do with the relationship between the brain and almost anything else to take any any view about. So, so the idea that we might learn about say linguistics from studying the brain in our current state of knowledge, mm -hmm. I, I think is kind of fanciful. Yeah. Um, so, so, so an aspect of, of this kind of issue is just pointing up an extreme case of ignorance on, on, on behalf of all theorists in this area. And the, the other thing I, I wanted to say was just that th there's a way of seeing why there couldn't be a completely straightforward kind of reductio argument here from, from the facts of, about the brain and the a conflict between those facts and the proposals being made in linguistics is just that we know that we can, given the brains we have, acquire facility with all kinds of completely formal languages, incl including, for example, mathematics. So, so we know that the brain is capable of representing and exploiting pure mathematics. So it couldn't be that there was a, a general argument from features of the structure of the brain that told us that it couldn't deal with, say, digital structure. Um, it, couldn't, it couldn't be, otherwise mathematics would be impossible. So I don't see that there are, a, a, I, I think there's a really good question, which is how on earth is any of this possible given what we know about the wetware of the brain? But I don't see any pressure at all here uh, against any of the things that linguists want to say about, uh, about linguistic structure and, and what it is that people represent when they know or have a particular natural language. I guess this is sort of related, but something I wanted to come to, which was the maybe the, the difference in thinking about language as some mm. schools of linguistics obviously do, as this sort of theoretical thing, as opposed to the point of view maybe of the ordinary user of language uh, and the sort of pragmatic understanding they may have of what they're doing themselves. Could you could you comment a bit on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think I mean it's related to this, this question. So one really hard question here it concerns the relationship between what linguists and what other kinds of theorists about, about language and about other things that people can do, what they want to say about our powers and what we know about the brain. That's one kind of a, a connection challenge. How can we explain 
that relationship and no one knows. And, and this is kind of another, uh, another, another issue of, of this kind is, given what we know, for example, about um, grammar, about syntax, how does that figure in what ordinary folk are both up to when they make use of sentences or, or whatever in communicating with one another, one another using bits of language? Um, and what's it got to do with their particular judgments about that? And I think none of this is none of this is straightforward. Right? So it, I mean, it's fairly clear that there are the particular kinds of judgments that, that that both Hazel and Richard have been have been pointing up, which we're well aware of. But those are the kind of tip of the theoretical iceberg. And what linguists want to do is provide theories that work towards explaining particular judgments we have, for example, about cases, particular ways in which we have of using. Um, bits of language and you know to some extent when we're doing linguistics we simply assume a fairly direct connection between those judgments and what the theories say so we aim to predict the judgments as if they were the deliverances of something like deduction from bits of knowledge in the possession of speakers so it's as if I know the rich details of a particular syntactic theory and then when you make a noise in my presence I exploit that knowledge by way of deducing what it says about the particular noises you're making. And if it comes up that what you're saying corresponds with what's allowed by my rules, then I treat what you're doing in one way. If it doesn't, treat it in some other way. But, but that's all a massive idealization given what we know. We, don't, we certainly don't have any straightforward way of understanding what our relationship is to the rules of these grammatical systems, syntactical systems as characterized by um, linguists, any more than we know how they relate to, to the brains of individual speakers. So there's a kind of placeholder here. We talk about knowledge, knowing these rules, having these rules. But almost certainly, that's the wrong way of thinking about our relationship to these systems of rules. Ordinarily, things we know are things we can report on. We can tell people things we know. Um, and ordinarily, the things we know interact in all kinds of ways with other things we know in order to deliver further consequences. And that, none of that happens with respect to the underlying rule systems that linguists have proposed to account for grammatical competence. Right? You can't be told, when Hazel tells me something about one of the rules, I can't put that together with knowledge I already possess about some of the other rules in order to deliver consequences that I can then report on in the way I can ordinarily do with things I know. So, I mean, really, I just think it's, it's a puzzle for linguists, philosophers, and psychologists to understand, before we even get into kind of connecting with neuroscience, to understand what the relationship is between speakers and these systems of formal rules that linguists want to come up with. So I guess I'm, I'm slightly puzzled by um, what you said about the, the, typically with knowledge is something that we can report on, and that's clearly not the case mm -hmm. with something like knowledge of, of syntactic rules, if it mm -hmm. were, then linguists would be out of a job because mm -hmm. there would be much less work to do. But surely there's, there's plenty of stuff that we have only tacit knowledge of. So there's, there's plenty of, of sort of abilities that I acquired as a child that I, I can't articulate to you how, how it is that I reach for my glass mm -hmm. or walk or any number of other things that, that are sort of among the things I did, sort of learned how to do as an infant. So why then shouldn't acquiring knowledge of language also be in that, in that category? I think in a way it is. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, one way, one way of putting the, the kind of question is, um, well, what is tacit knowledge? Mm -hmm. so, so on the face of it, talk of tacit knowledge is just a placeholder given character by the kind of story you just told. There are all kinds of things we do, speaking a language, understanding a language, being able to play tennis, whatever it is. There are all kinds of things that, that we or some of us can do where we don't really know the details about what goes on in our brains uh, or our bodies when we do those things. Um, and that's, that's completely fair. So it's not that there's an objection here to what linguists are doing. It's rather that we lack a clear 
well worked out account of what it is that we want to say about our relation to say the mathematics that goes on when I catch a ball. Like clearly at some level I'm processing some fairly complex uh, intuitive physics involving lots of maths when I catch a ball and yet I don't have a clue about any of that. So what's my relation to to those facts that I'm processing. So it's not an objection, it's a genuine question of clarification about how we should understand the relationship we bear to these rules of grammar. And you see this with, you know, so Chomsky started out perfectly naturally talking about knowledge of grammar, then got fed up of being attacked by philosophers who worried about whether that was quite the right way of, of putting the idea, so moved to cognizing the grammar, and then philosophers decided to kick up a fuss about that. Um, and you know, so some theorists just talk about having a grammar or having a language. So, so trying to avoid uh, ideas that go along with ordinary talk about, about knowing. But none of that's really very helpful. It's just kind of relabeling the, the bulge in the carpet. Um, and I think it's a you know, real challenge that I'd like to see more work by linguists, psychologists, and philosophers on to try and figure out how we should think about our relationship to these, to these rules that we clearly, in some sense, know. I think that, that bulge in the carpet is a really nice piece of language <laughs> while we're on it. So I promised you a question up there, and then maybe one more from, okay, and we really have four or five minutes, so you have to be quicker than your pal. <laughs> uh, I'm certainly quicker than he is. Um, so. <laughs> With regards to the lady at the front who mentioned earlier the um, annoyances of people saying I could care less and, such on, and so, on, so on and so forth, is it, <laughs> have a good evening by the way, um, <laughs> is it perhaps because, so is, are these rules becoming more eroded because of the advent of like cinema and music and other forms of like, conveyances of language because prior to those it was all letter writing and communication by verbal speech whereas now we see such emotion conveyed in, in subtextual like looks and glances that we convey those meanings using those tools and as a result the rules with which we approach language cease to be as important because ultimately language is a conduit for meaning and if we can convey those meanings elsewhere um it's like we have we have emojis now for instance and those those you know are sprinkled throughout our sentences in ways that aren't entirely coherent or rule-based but we convey the meanings that we want to convey and it's perhaps that linked to the fact that these rules are becoming eroded or more fluid or liquid in some sense? Or I'm not a linguist like he is. So. Okay, thank you. And then this person here. Um, uh, do you think grammar should be so strongly enforced in school when systems like autocorrect uh, could ultimately replace that knowledge? Okay, thank you. Um, so I guess sort of two final questions. One on maybe uh, thinking about language as being responsive to new kinds of inputs and kind of uh, trying to cope with that or maybe not, that sounds very negative, maybe like, you know, lifting itself up to that with much more creative and new forms of language expression. And then second, quite, you know, direct question about like where we should see the status of grammar teaching or grammar enforcement given new technologies and the ways they impact the way people learn these kinds of things. Can, can I ask you, I, I didn't understand the, sec your, your, the second question. So the, the second question was, if I'm paraphrasing you correctly, uh, given the situation in schools of auto, we have autocorrect now, we've got all this technology that kind of helps us along the way, should, you know, sort of rote learning or teaching of grammar be, you know, should that either change in response to the way we engage with new technology or should it be maybe gotten rid of because, you know, other things are stepping in to help us. You're making some funny assumptions. There, there is no grammar. There's no rote learning of grammar in our schools. I mean, you may have been to a very special school, but but you, you, the, the typical school doesn't, until very recently, didn't teach grammar. Are you thinking of the SPAG test? Um, well, at least in examinations such as GCSEs, there is much an expectation that in order to achieve high grades, you must know have a high standard of okay. grammar. So even if it's not being taught, it's being corrected or being yes. marked down. It's response. being expected. But where does rote learning come it, in? Oh, I invented rote learning. That's oh, my fault. Yes, right. But okay. this idea that in response, you know, the, the question stands, I think, well, you know. The, the, as we speak, there's, a, there's a, a very interesting research project underway um, just uh, a few hundred yards from here um, on whether uh, a, a very good internet, sys uh, internet resource that's been developed at UCL is going to help to, in the teaching of grammar in primary schools. 
Uh, grammar has come back in recently. It, it died in the middle of the 20th century. It's, it's back again now in primary schools and in uh, and in secondary schools in, in principle. The, the problem is that teachers don't know any grammar, um, and so how can they teach it? Uh, and one possible solution is that they can learn grammar with the help of digital resources like this one in, in, in the English department at UCL. Who knows? The result should be out in about a year. And then I just want to, before we leave, just maybe comment on, I thought it was kind of an optimistic note in the question, maybe instead of thinking about, you know, leading to police grammar, you know, are we seeing this sort of proliferation of new and interesting ways of communication rather than something like, you know, the falling apart of grammatical standards? Okay, I'll just summarise it because the mic, so he, he was saying, especially in response to the, the sort of rise or the, the greater availability of sources using African-American English, London grammar, this kind of thing. Yeah, and you see, for instance, the influence of African-American English in uh, spe speakers of, of, other lingu of, of, of other varieties of, of English, and that appears to be, as far as I know, influenced by the internet and, and, things, and things like that. But... I mean, language has always been changing. English has always been changing. This, this isn't, this isn't a, a new phenomenon. So, so Dick mentioned Old English and Middle English, and there's a reason why if, you're, if you were to open Beowulf, unless you had studied Old English, you wouldn't be able to, to understand what you were reading. And there's always been sort of a complex of, of kind of cultural factors that have been um, involved with, the, with that. So there's always been sort of contact between different speakers that bring about sort of influence and change uh, onto the language. And so that in itself, I think, should just be regarded as, as, as the norm and, and nothing new. But I mean, what your question is pointing to is, is that probably now there are sort of new influences and perhaps there's, there's kind of greater access to uh, how speakers living in the States uh, speak because, because of Netflix and the internet, I guess, basically. Okay, yeah. thank, thank you for that question. We'll have to wind up now. But I do, I mean, genuinely respond to that. I think it would make its own good event to try and discuss new modes of communication and the influence of, of different linguistic cultures on, on you know, other cultures. Uh, so I'm just going to finish by thanking the Royal Institute of Philosophy for sponsoring this event and then thanking our speakers for speaking and then you for coming. So thank you very much. Thank you.